This is Dr. Russell Blaylock, and you're listening to the Blaylock Health Channel. Most of us have heard about Fukushima disasters occurred on March 11, 2011, in which these uh, nuclear reactors were destroyed or, or damaged to such an extent that they were releasing radiation into the ocean and the atmosphere. And within about a two-day uh, time period, it ended up in the United States, began to pick up radiation levels in various states. Prior to that, we had the Chernobyl event. We had Three Mile Island and nuclear testing in the United States in which uh, approximately 200 above of ground uh, nuclear bombs were set off in the 1950s and 1960s before the test ban treaty was put into effect. So wh- what we want to talk about today is even though we have no choice in being inundated at this point with these radioactive uh, elements in our atmosphere or food or water, uh, what can you do about it? Now, one of the most popular things you see on most of the health websites Take iodine, iodine tablets. Uh, there's a big sale on iodine. I remember when Fukushima first happened, they ran out of iodine because so many people were buying it. The main effect of iodine is protecting the thyroid, which is a very sensitive organ in the body to radiation effect, particularly cancer induction. Uh, so uh, it is a concern. And of course, that's because the thyroid will quickly take up radioactive iodine-131. It accumulates in the gland and it acts as a source of constant radioactive bombardment of the cells and can produce a malignant change. But the question that's pretty much been ignored by most of the people talking about radio protection is what about the rest of the body? What about the bone marrow? What about the GI tract and liver? What about the brain, uh, lungs, the other tissues that we know are really radio sensitive? There's not a lot of talk about protecting these tissues. And of course, iodine supplementation is probably not going to provide uh, much, if any, protection to these organs. What is not known by most people is that NASA has done extensive testing on radioprotectants. The reason they do that is because the astronauts in outer space are exposed to rather high levels of gamma radiation because they don't have the filtering effect of the uh, atmosphere. And this is a real problem. And one of the problems that's been faced by that quest to send spaceships to things like Mars, uh, that would be such a prolonged, years-long exposure to gamma radiation, the question is, how, how can you protect the astronauts? Well, you can't do lead shielding or any shielding on the spaceship. It would be too heavy. So the only alternative is to protect the astronauts uh, with different agents. Now, they've created a number of drugs to try to protect people against radiation. Uh, one is called WR2721. Uh, most of these things just have uh, numbers as their catalog number. This is a very effective agent, but the problem is it's very toxic. And there's a lot of side effects and uh, can include things like blindness. So they're quite serious. Of more interest recently has been the fact that a, a number of natural agents are very powerful protectants against uh, radiation damage, particularly the gamma radiation. And what I want to do today is go through a couple of these and just kind of look at what they do and just how potent they are. And, of course, the important thing is that all of these agents uh, are not only uh, quite safe and have very, very few side effects, but the other effects of these flavonoids are very healthy effects, for instance, preventing cancer, protecting the brain against degeneration, strokes, heart attacks. Uh, All of these things are are, uh, side effects, protective and beneficial side effects of these type of agents. Uh, one of the uh, interesting one was an immune stimulant called beta-glucan. Uh, beta-glucan is found in the cell wall of things like yeast. And what they found, if you isolate the beta-glucan and purify it, it acts as a good cellular immune stimulant. Uh, one of the side effect discoveries of beta-glucan is it's a very potent protector against radiation damage of tissues, particularly the hemopoietic tissue, that is the tissues inside the bone marrow. The other thing is that beta-glucan was found to stimulate stem cells production, that is uh, replacement of these damaged RBCs and WBCs, the white blood cells. 
Uh, if we look back, for instance, in uh, the uh, survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, one of the most common uh, damaging effects was damage to their bone marrow. They developed sometimes a total wipeout of all their white blood cells, which made them very susceptible to things like infections. And uh, there was a increased incidence of lymphoma and leukemia, that is, malignancies of these type of cells, that is, your blood cells that are originating from your bone marrow. In order to replace these cells, you need to stay stimulate and protect the stem cells because that's where they come from. Well, interestingly, beta-glucan is very potent at doing that. It stimulates these stem cells to replace the damaged and lost adult cells. So that's a very important effect of beta-glucan. And they also found that if you combine beta-glucan with other uh, agents that are used to protect against radiation, it has even a greater effect. Now, to look at some of the other things that we've discovered about uh, radio protection, one of the interesting ones is curcumin. Curcumin is an extract of the uh, turmeric spice. Uh, curcumin has undergone a tremendous amount of research because it's anti-carcinogenic. But in the field of uh, radio protection, they found out it, it is very, very powerful in protecting all cells of every type against damage by radiation of every, every form, particularly the gamma radiation. In fact, if you look at people who have treatment for cancers, uh, one of the problems they have radiating the chest is they'll develop a delayed pulmonary fibrosis, in which is a destruction of the, of the lung tissue so that the scarring inside the lung is so intense they're no longer able to breathe. Well, this is a big problem for treatment of uh, patients for cancer and radiating them is this pulmonary fibrosis that occurs months or even a year later. And what they discovered, if you take animals and reproduce this but give uh, some of them curcumin, the ones that were given curcumin are protected against this pulmonary fibrosis, and it's a very powerful protection. And one of the reasons it does it is because curcumin causes the body to generate very high levels of a very important antioxidant, particularly in the lung epithelial, that is the cells that are primarily damaged. In studies on other animals, they found that if you take very high doses of gamma radiation, for instance, high as four gray units, uh, which produces the maximum damage to human lymphocytes, and you examine those cells comparing using curcumin versus not using it, you see extensive damage to the ones in which you just expose it to the radiation. That includes the production of high levels of lipid peroxidation, uh, high levels of uh, free radical generation, which damages the DNA, all of the cell structures, the membranes of the cell. This also can cause the cell ultimately to die or to be so impaired that it does not function very well. Now, if you look at the comparison to that in which you added curcumin to the lymphocytes and then radiated it with this powerful cobalt-60 radiation, we found that, in fact, it dramatically lowered these damaging lipid peroxidation products, significantly reduced the free radical generation, and it caused the lymphocyte to upregulate, that is, to produce more of its protectant antioxidant systems like superoxide dismutase, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, and glutathione itself. And these things are very powerful in protecting the cells against this damage. So curcumin is being shown to be a leader uh, in protecting all types of cells, not just the thyroid. And it's particularly protective of the brain. One of the problems with curcumin is absorption. Uh, it's very poorly absorbed if consumed as a powder. But if you mix it with uh, extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil, you can increase the absorption as much as 11-fold. Then you're getting very high levels that go throughout the tissues in the body. The other thing is very safe. Uh, very high concentrations of curcumin have been given to humans and have very few side effects, sometimes nausea at the extreme level, but in most cases it's a very benign substance. So it has a very high level of safety and extremely high level of protection against radiation. Another commonly found product is lycopene. Lycopene is one of the carotenoid substances. It's what makes tomatoes red and watermelons red, and it's a, a very powerful antioxidant. When they looked at animals in which they exposed them to this uh, very high level of gamma radiation, they found a similar effect. That is, it stimulated production of these protective cell antioxidant systems like glutathione and glutathione peroxidase, uh, superoxide dismutase, and catalase. So it's, it's also a very effective uh, radioprotectant. Ferulic acid, which is a flavonoid found in a lot of fruits and vegetables. It's a very common 
of flavonoid in fruits and vegetables. When they tested it, they found it not only upregulated or increased the amount of these protective antioxidants and uh, protectants against lipid peroxidation, but it also dramatically improved the hemopoietic stem cell recovery, that is, these cells that replace the damaged white blood cells in your bone marrow. And that's extremely important, not just for radiation accidents like Fukushima or Chernobyl, but also for exposure to medical x-rays. Another common flavonoid, in fact, one of the more common flavonoids found in vegetables and fruits is quercetin. This has been extensively tested and found also to be very effective in protection against radiation damage. And uh, one of the studies in which they used mice and exposed them to as high a dose as 9 gray, which is uh, more than twice as high as the, the previous levels they were using and has a very high mortality, they found that if you use the quercetin in the animals, uh, you had a very high survival rate, whereas the animals that were exposed to the uh, high-level radiation without it, almost all of them died. One of the effects of radiation that's uh, often forgotten is the effect on the brain. And it can affect the brain both directly and indirectly. Uh, when we had studies coming out of Chernobyl, they noticed that the, the cleanup workers, the people that were exposed to the highest levels of radiation, began over months to years to developing an increased incidence of psychopathology, that is, things like schizophrenia. They also had a high incidence of depression and suicide. And they had a lot of difficulty with thinking. Uh, so intensive testing of these cleanup workers in the Chernobyl incidents and in some other incidents of exposed to radiation finds that, in fact, the brain is damaged by this radiation. And uh, one of the, the real puzzles is why would it cause schizophrenia? Well, there's several possibilities. One is that the radiation would stimulate the brain to become chronically inflamed, that is, through microglial activation. And the other is that the radiation would damage the gut, create a leaky gut syndrome, and then when the person would eat things that contain gluten, like uh, the wheat or rye, the gluten would, in an indirect way, produce the schizophrenia. And we see this in, in clinical cases in the United States. People that are gluten-sensitive can develop schizophrenia-like syndrome. Now, we've gone through some of these uh, different agents, the curcumin, quercetin, ferulic acid, the lycopene, and the beta-glucan. And uh, while I talk about them individually, what we find, and numerous studies are finding, is that if you combine them, if you put them together, in other words, you're taking multiple supplements with these flavonoids and carotenoids and, and even vitamin D and vitamin C in combination, they produce a much higher level of protection, even against what in the normal situation would be a lethal dose of radiation. And that's what they found in the animals, for instance. One study in which they exposed them to the gamma rays, the unprotected animals, uh, 100% of them died. And when they used the uh, flavonoid radioprotectants, 90% of them survived. So you can see this is not a minor effect. This is major protection for these organs. Now, uh, because radiation is used in, in cancer therapy, several studies looked at the the, the idea, well, uh, if it's so radioprotective, wouldn't it protect the cancer as well? Well, interestingly, what they found is there's a differential effect. For instance, if you expose a patient to very high levels of radiation, which is going to expose the normal tissues and organs surrounding the cancer, uh, they found that if you give them these agents like curcumin or quercetin, it actually protects the normal tissue around the tumor against the damage by the radiation but it makes the tumor cells infinitely more sensitive to the radiation. That is, it increases the cancer-killing effect uh, of the uh, cancer cells itself while protecting the normal tissues against damage, which is the best of all worlds. So even if a person has a cancer and then an event like this happens uh, with Fukushima, you're protected and you don't have to worry about making your cancer grow faster. In fact, it's a very powerful anti-cancer effect. Now, with Fukushima, we need to also understand a little bit about the effect here. The radiation traveled from Japan to the shores of the United States and the western coastline in about two days after the incident. Uh, we're continuing to get uh, radiation in the atmosphere coming towards 
the United States and penetrating deeper into the United States, even New York, and it's heading for Europe as well. And what we find, there's different areas, for instance, in Colorado, in Wyoming, uh, we're seeing very high levels in some areas. And that's because of precipitation, as this is in the upper atmosphere and, and you have precipitation and the, this radioactive material collects in the clouds, wherever it rains will deposit the highest concentration at that time. Fortunately, in the very early stages, there's very little rain over states like Louisiana and Mississippi, so they didn't get a very high dose. Uh, but Arkansas and Missouri and Colorado got a much higher dose. The other thing is the effect on food. Once it rains and it's in the soil, then the food takes up radiation and it enters the plant and the plant becomes uh, radioactive. The same thing with seafood. Many of the fish around the, uh, the Japanese island became highly radioactive, particularly the larger fish like sharks and, and tuna. And they uh, pass through the, the stream uh, along the oceanic stream along Japan, and, and they're ending up in the coast of Australia, ending up along the west coast of the United States and other places. Uh, recently, they've uh, discovered a number of tuna off the coast of California that had severe radiation damage. So the, the question now is, is your food supply in danger? Uh, when you go out and eat fish at a restaurant, is it radioactive? Well, the United States Environmental Protection Agency is really trying to avoid this. They don't want to talk about it because it would damage the restaurant industry. And so they've cut their testing from daily testing, the uh, testing every three months in order to uh, help defray uh, having to even uh, discuss this issue. But the, the danger of the food being radioactive is much greater than uh, atmospheric radiation in that you're going to absorb this through your GI tract. It's going to be de deposited in various organs for very long periods of time. How long it's deposited and how long you're in danger of the radiation depends on the isotope. Iodine-131 doesn't last very very long. It lasts for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks, and then gradually dissipates. It has a very short half-life. Whereas the uh, things like cesium-134, cesium-137 have a much longer half-life, about 30 years. Some of the other isotopes that are released uh, can have a half-life as much as 10,000 years. So it can end up with uh, radiation for a very long period of time. For instance, strontium-90 is deposited in the bones. Uh, and so you have a young child drinking milk, eating cheese, that strontium-90 is deposited in the bones for a lifetime. And that increases the risk of leukemia because it's right by the cells that produce red blood cells, white blood cells for the body. So uh, this is why protection by these these flavonoids and various uh, antioxidants is very important long term because you're going to be eating this food for years, uh, this radioactive uh, food, even though it's low levels of radiation. The problem with low level radiation over a chronic period of time is it's producing chronic inflammation, which leads to a higher incidence of not only cancers, but also other disorders. People don't Always understand that you can have many disorders, arthritis, uh, muscle weakness, different degenerative conditions. Uh, like we said, the schizophrenia, the suicidal tendency, the depression, all of these things can be consequences. Pulmonary disorders as you're breathing in these uh, isotopes through your lungs and it's deposited on the surface of the lungs that are getting radiated. So this is why we need long-term safe way to reduce this damage. And the safest and most powerful we have is these agents that I just discussed. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful, and as we have more information, new updates, we'll bring that to you. Thank you very much for listening. The information contained within these programs is not intended to replace or contradict that of your physician. This information is for educational purposes only.